My name is Rod Ewing. I'm a co-director here at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. And it's uh, really a great pleasure today to introduce Mark Peters, who's the director of Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, INL is the lead laboratory for all things nuclear in the National Laboratory System. And Mark has been one of the, I would say, chief spokespersons for nuclear over the last, uh, uh, well, last, last decade. Uh, Mark uh, began as uh, director at INL in 2015. Uh, I think he must have done a good job because by 2017 he had been uh, uh, awarded the Laboratory Director of the Year Award. So uh, he at least uh, did a good job for the, those few years. Yeah. Uh, he's also the chair of the Executive Committee for the Council of Laboratory Directors. Uh, before going to INL, uh, he was at Argonne National Laboratory as an associate laboratory director uh, for energy and global security. And before that, he was at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where he was uh, chief scientist reporting to the director for the Office of Civilian and Radioactive Waste Management, which was the office in charge of developing the Yucca Mountain Project. And in fact, that's where Mark and I first met. Uh, I think I was, must have been on a review committee, and Mark was uh, uh, one of those people who had to convince us that everything was, was fine. And I have to say, Mark uh, did an extraordinary job in dealing with a variety of oversight committees and responding to not only the committees but to the public um, on technical issues in a way that uh, both technical and the public uh, uh, could understand. Uh, so it's uh, a real pleasure to welcome Mark, and Mark will be telling us the future of nuclear energy. Thanks, Rod. Afternoon. Hope everybody's well today. So, uh, uh, Rod, again, thank you for the kind introduction. It's it's wonderful to be here at CSAC. Uh, so, um, I'm going to talk to you today about my views on what I see as the future of nuclear energy. I, uh, full disclosure, it will be, uh, it will be, I will strike an optimistic tone. I will try to be, I, I will be objective, but no surprise, I'm going to talk about wh what I think is a role for nuclear energy, but I, I look forward to the discussion because I think, you know, nuclear energy uh, go forward is at an interesting uh, place in the United States, certainly, but as you look globally, this is really a global question, and you see nuclear energy clearly looking for expansion across the globe, but the question is, what's the U.S. role and whatnot? So we'll talk a lot about that. <clears throat> but I thought I would start with um, a little bit about, just briefly about the national laboratories, uh, recognizing that some in the room know a lot about the laboratories and some, some perhaps know less about the national laboratories. Hi, Rune. Uh, so, 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 uh, so Idaho National Laboratory is one of 17 Department of Energy national laboratories. Uh, they're spread across the United States, as you can see here. Of course, one here, one here at Stanford, SLAC, SLAC uh, Acceler National Accelerator Laboratory is located here at SLAC. Uh, you have Livermore here in the Bay Area, as well as Lawrence Berkeley, uh, up, the, up the hill from campus over at, at UC Berkeley. And you also have Sandia La National Laboratories has operations here in the Bay Area as well, over by Livermore. Um, these laboratories, again, they, they trace all the way back to the, Man they sort of grew out of the Manhattan Project. Um, and so you have an array of laboratories, some of which are focused on very fundamental science, some of which are focused on, on the weapons uh, stockpile of the, of, of the nuclear stockpile stewardship for the nuclear weapons stockpile, others that are focused on applied energy research. Many of them do multiple kinds of research across the whole spectrum of energy and national security. Um, but you could tell, you could have a whole talk just on the history of the labs and how they grew out of the Manhattan Project. Um, in the case of Idaho National Laboratory, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the history because it's quite relevant to the past, but also the, the path forward for nuclear energy in the United States and across the globe. So in 1943, so it's our, our, main, our main offices are in Idaho Falls. So if you know that part of Idaho, it's uh, north of Salt Lake City, eastern Idaho. Um, 
but we operate 890 square miles of, of site in addition to the laboratory facilities. And so it was actually created in 1943 as the Naval Proving Ground. So the U.S. Navy came in. Uh, munitions were made about 50 miles south of the, of the site, brought up uh, for these battleship gun ammunition, and they were tested on our site. So during the war, that was, that was sort of the genesis. And then after the, after the war, after World War II, the labs were created. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission created the laboratories, and they grew out. Some went to the weapons, some went to civil nuke. Uh, Idaho, Idaho, the precursor to Idaho National Laboratory was a national reactor testing station was created as part of that Oak Ridge, Argonne National Reactor Testing Station were squarely focused on the civil nuclear sector. So in the course of his, over the course of the history of the site, there was 52 reactors uh, built, tested, demonstrated, some to failure uh, in, our, in our past. So if you look at the reactors that are operating in the U.S. and worldwide, you can trace much, much, of their, much of their evolution back to something that was tested at the National Reactor Testing Station. So as we evolved through our history, we became a national lab uh, focused, on uh, focused on not only energy but also environmental cleanup. Uh, the, Navy, the Navy has a long-standing long -standing mission there, so there is a legacy cleanup mission at the laboratory. Uh, I'm responsible for the research. There's a separate contractor. We can talk about that perhaps during discussion that focuses on cleanup. Um, but there's, a, there's that legacy. When, when the environmental management mission at DOE was doing science, uh, I would say, uh, there was a role that we played in, the, in that. But then, as Rod mentioned, in 2005, the Department of Energy made the decision to take what was then Argonne West, so Argonne East in Chicago, used the, the site as a test ground. They took Argonne West and what was then the Idaho National Engineer Energy and Environmental Laboratory and combined it into what is now Idaho National Laboratory. So we're focused, as Rod said, we're designated as the lead nuclear energy laboratory for the laboratory system. That's not to say that we're the only lab that does nuclear energy research, but that's our, folk, that's our primary mission. We're actually growing and expanding in our mission space into broad areas of national security that I won't talk about today, uh, nuclear nonproliferation, uh, cybersecurity, uh, as well as a growing mission in, in the renewable energy space as well. We are an applied science and engineering laboratory. Um, with a very strong applied focus, uh, close partnerships with industry as well. Um, so that, that's kind of the genesis. I should also remind everybody that the laboratories, with the exception of one, 16 of the labs are so-called GOCO, so government-owned, contractor-operated laboratories. And, and in our case, we're managed by the, the, the prime contractors, Battelle, which is a nonprofit research and development organization in Columbus, Ohio, that currently manages six laboratories. So myself and all the folks who work at the lab are effectively Battelle Energy Alliance employees. So this is the partnership that, is made, that, that makes up the, the, the uh, contractor that manages Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, we, have, we have the industry partners. We also have EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, and a university consor consortium that includes the Idaho Research Universities as well as a national university consortium uh, made up of the, of, the, of the universities that you see there. Um, so we're... we're all, as I said, the 16 labs are managed by contracts with the government, typically in five-year increments. Uh, there, there's decisions made about whether to compete the lab or perhaps extend the contract. So this is pretty typical the way the labs operate. So this is just a timeline that shows the history of the place. I've already mentioned the 52 reactors. Um, again, as I said, for those who follow nuclear technology, pressurized water reactors, boiling water reactors, uh, liquid metal fast reactors, uh, many of the technologies, high temperature gas reactors that were tested and demonstrated were done, done in Idaho. And I'm going to talk more about going forward. Uh, many of these have since been demolished, taken down. We currently operate four reactors at the site, all test machines. Uh, and we're in the process of starting the design of a new test machine that I'll talk about. And then there's also the talk of demonstrating advanced technologies. And I'll talk a lot about that as I go through the talk and the role the site might play in that. So this is a little bit of a, I'll call it sort of an advertisement. I, I, only, I put it up here only to make to start, to start the conversation about what is the value proposition of nuclear energy. This is from the Nuclear Energy Institute. It's a trade organization, so no surprise. They're going to talk a lot about the benefits in terms of jobs, economics. Um, but the, the important point that I want to bring up here is the important role 
that nuclear brings to the clean energy mix. Uh, so the conversation in Washington has really shifted. It started to shift during the Obama administration. It continues to shift, even though the climate change conversation is complicated right now in Washington. It's become clear, and it's become uh, sort of becoming very bipartisan in Washington that if you're serious about mitigating uh, climate change down the road, renewables are vital, vi vitally, vitally important, and they're going to continue to expand. But there's an interesting discussion, notwithstanding the Green New Deal that just rolled out and the, the role of nuclear and whatnot, and we can talk about that during discussion. Um, there's starting to be a growing consensus that nuclear energy probably needs to be a part of the future if we're serious about minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. Yes, there's no free lunch. We'll talk about spent fuel a little bit. Probably want to talk a lot more about that during discussion. Uh, so, it, But it's clean in the sense of limited, if you look at the life cycle, uh, it's limited greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as compared to, say, coal, for example, or natural gas. So that's an important consideration. We can talk about, uh, I'll talk about the existing fleet and the contribution it makes, but we should also talk about, okay, if we're serious about, you know, say, me meeting Paris goals, uh, can we build nuclear fast enough to be a part of that solution? That's, that's an important question, and, and, and I'm probably not going to be able to answer it to your satisfaction, quite frankly, but I want to talk to you about what it might take. And I also reemphasize that what we do in the United States is a different conversation than what's happening globally, and we, we can talk more about that as well. The other important challenge and opportunity that exists is the cost. A lot of information here. This is from Lazard. It's just a levelized cost of electricity. We could argue a lot probably about whether that's a good measure. These are cost ranges, but I just draw your attention. This is cost of new generation. So once nuclear is up, it's relatively cheap to operate and generate electricity. But it's very, very expensive to field. High capital costs up front. And you can see when you look at particularly the, the decrease in the cost of renewables coming onto the grid of various sorts, nuclear is quite expensive. And so one of the key research questions that has to be addressed if we're serious about advanced nuclear down the road is how do you reduce cost? And that can't just be the, the reactor, the, the design of the reactor core itself. It's really the balance of plant. It's the amount of concrete. It's, it's a lot of the other, it's the more civil construction that's actually driving costs significantly high, higher in nuclear, and that gets into the safety, safety aspects of it and the security aspects, aspects of it as well. But the bottom line is it takes a long time to put, put into the field, and it's expensive. Um, so those are important questions that we face. Uh, in the United States in particular, there's a lot of downward pressure. I'll talk more about the existing fleet, uh, what the, the industry would call premature retirements. Because of the pressure of low natural gas prices, as well as some of the market structures that we see across the nation, nu existing nuclear is under tremendous pressure uh, right now. Um, can't talk about nuclear without talking about spent fuel. Um, we do not have, as the United States, have a policy path right now to dispose of nuclear, spent nuclear fuel. There's over 80,000 metric tons sitting on sites, sitting in either wet storage or in dry casks awaiting a permanent solution. The, the law, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, calls for development of a repository at Yucca Mountain. Um, there's been a policy step back from that, I would say. So right now, we're at, a, we're at a place where there isn't really a policy path to dispose of spent fuel in deep geology. That's, that's the, the policy of the United States. The United States has made the decision decades ago not to reprocess spent fuel. And again, that's something we might want to talk about. Uh, during discussion. Other countries are doing that. French, for example, are doing reprocessing. Chinese and Russians intend to. The Indians are looking at it. So many countries are looking at that, whereas the Scandinavians, for example, are far along on doing direct disposal of spent fuel in deep geology. So, so, and there's been a, Rod, Rod led a study that I was a part of that, that, talked, that thought a lot about what the path forward might be for spent fuel management in the United States and how we could learn from some of our colleagues across the globe. So we can talk more about that. But the bottom line is this is not a sustainable solution to have things temporarily stored at multiple sites across the nation. You've got to come up with a permanent solution. And quite frankly, it, it is an obstacle to further nuclear development. It, from a strict regulatory perspective, you need to have a solution. But also from a public confidence perception perspective, the, the social science aspects of it. If we don't have a solution, um, why, why build more? We're already creating quite a legacy. So a big challenge for us. This is, to me, while there's important, interesting science, uh, scientific and technological questions, a lot of this is about social science and politics. 
and policy that gets the, that, that comes to play here to come up with a sustainable solution. And it requires political will as well to, to move forward. Um, the other aspect, that, and, and I know CSAC thinks a lot about this, is the nexus with national security. Um, and, 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 and the important point I want to make here is there's a hard to quantify benefit of having a strong civil nuclear sector in terms of national security leadership for the United States. Um, and, and really what we're living off of now was, is that legacy, right? The ability to, for example, be influential in discussions around the, what, what was going on in Iran, for example. That was built out of, out of the legacy that was the National Labs. Uh, you know, as, as Arun knows, I mean, Secretary Moniz relied very, very heavily on the National Labs during that whole run up to the discussions uh, with, with, in the negotiations with the Iranians. And that, it, it produces that sort of, de that century long influence that the United States has because we had that strong civil nuclear sector. We also have the nuclear navy, which continues to be very, very strong. But we're in an interesting place now because the supply chain on the civil nuclear side in the United States has degraded. We're not building anything anymore, really, to, of any significance. And so we're at this interesting point where if you don't have a strong civil nuclear sector, what is the national security leadership of the United States in the nuclear space look like, say, a couple decades from now? It's going to look different. Um, and so, so one of the, and, but this is real hard to quantify. You can sort of think about cost in a way, and you can also think about, you know, prices on carbon and think about how that fits into, but this is a really important benefit of nuclear energy, civil nuclear sector, and that national security benefit, but it's very hard to quantify. And many people have tried to do it, uh, but it's, it's, it's an important part of the considerations. Along those lines, if you look at the, the plants that are being built across the globe now, uh, this is actually a little out of date. I have three here. There's really only two being built in the United States and Georgia now because the South Carolina plants, the, AP one, the Westinghouse designs, the AP-1000s are no longer being constructed. Uh, but you can see other countries are actively building within their own countries and also actively looking to export their designs. Um, so as you look at, for example, Saudi Arabia being interested in building perhaps civil nuclear power plants in their country. The UAE has already been doing it with South Korea. They're, they're building South Korean reactors. Uh, the, Saudi Arab the Saudis are looking at it very, very, very seriously. And all of these countries, including the U.S., are all looking to export their designs to Saudi Arabia for construction uh, go forward. So, so the question from the U.S. perspective is, okay, you have... The Russians, the South Koreans, and the Chinese, for example, who are very active in the export market. What is the U.S.'s position on that, and does the U.S. want to seriously compete in that world? And again, this is something that I know folks in this room think a lot about. It's an important nexus with nuclear security that's important to, important to consider. So it's a really different world than, say, it was in 1950 uh, when, when, when IN, the precursor of INL was, was created. So what about the current fleet in the United States? Now I'm going to get very centric to the U.S. Uh, 98 plants spread across the states that are shown there in green. Um, they operate, you know, uh, about a little less than 20% of the electricity from the, in the United States comes from nuclear. Um, that's been relatively stable over the past, past decade or two. Um, they operate with a high capacity factor. Um, they operate well. Um, you, you, know about the oper you know about the accidents. We've, we've, you've heard about Three Mile Island in the United States, Chernobyl in the Soviet, then Soviet Union, and of course Fukushima in 2011. Um, designs that are, with the exception of Chernobyl, some, the Fukushima design is a similar design to some of the plants that are being operated in the United States. Um, but in general, they operate with high capacity factors, the safety records are good. Uh, I've, I've talked about the spent fuel inventory. So the spent fuel at the commercial sites is being stored in an interim, interim state across all of these locations. So that's the current fleet. So, so before I go on, so let's talk just briefly. So, so I, I mentioned already about premature retirements. Uh, back in the sort of 2000 and early 2000s, there was discussion of a renaissance. All this, there was going to be a, a big boom in construction. 18, 20, maybe even 30 new plants would have been built by now. That never materialized, in large part because of ultimately th there, there just wasn't a business model for it. 
Uh, so the utilities have really backed off on that. So right now, the only two new two plants that are being built are being built in Southern Company territory in Georgia, uh, Vogel three and four, uh, and they're fame. They're they're they're. It's very well known that they're over schedule, uh, uh, behind schedule, and over budget significantly. Um, these are big machines. They're gigawatt scale plants. Um, it's an AP one thousand, a Westinghouse design, an excellent design. Uh, the Chinese are also building a sim the same design, and they're doing it actually more cost effectively and also closer to on schedule. Um, so one one of the questions is part of it's part of it's because the U.S. hasn't built something in a very very long time. There's also a difference in the regulatory structure as well. Um, but the bottom line is is that these are currently producing 20 percent electricity, and yes, they're not emitting they're not emis emitting greenhouse gases. So as you think about some of these machines going offline perhaps prematurely, and then they're being replaced by natural gas primarily, uh, you're going to see, you're going to ultimately see, at least in the nearer term, a rise in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere because of the contribution of natural gas versus, versus nuclear. So the interesting conversation that's now happening is that some of the environmental groups are seeing that, and you're starting to see some of the environmental groups coming in and saying, hey, let's be careful here and be thoughtful about how the current fleet operates in the United States and whether premature retirements may exasper exasperate greenhouse gas emissions uh, in, in a way that we're not, that we, we'd rather not have. Um, so that's an interesting conversation. But it's the promise of advanced that I think is really getting the environmental movement in particular, at least some aspects of it, excited, excited about it. Um, Ed, you, you all have probably famously seen the Green New Deal was rolled out here, here just last week. Uh, there was a leaked fact sheet that said phase out nuclear in 10 years. That was uh, pulled off the website. AOC pulled it off her website. Uh, but, but there's an interesting conversation to be had with the Green New Deal now hitting, you know, what is the role of nuclear? Because there's still clearly a large component of the environmental movement that just does not feel comfortable with nuclear. And a lot of it's because of the safety issues and also because of spent fuel. So you've got this current fleet. Now, this current fleet's been operating, in some cases, for 40 years. The utilities that are operating these plants are moving to 60 and even some are even contemplating 80-year licenses, uh, extending their, their licenses out to 80 years. That, that presents interesting applied research and development programs. So the government, there's a lot here, but the laboratories, and, and we have a prominent role, have been working very closely with the utilities on a, lo a lot of different aspects of sustaining and modernizing the existing fleet. These are government-funded programs, Department of Energy-funded programs. Light Water Reactor Sustainability Program is the sort of centerpiece. And it's looking at materials aging. It's looking at being able to reduce operating costs. It's looking at being able to reduce risk margins, uh, developing advanced fuel concepts that might be to more tolerant to accidents. All important work that's been going on. There's a timeline. Uh, these are very closely integrated with utilities and with the vendors uh, in partnership between the government and the private sector. So a, a key role for the government here, and again, to be able to sustain the existing fleet, address those technical questions that are required in order to be able to extend the license, say, to 60 or even 80 years. There's a continuum of innovation. So a lot of the existing, existing plants are, are light water reactors. They're moderated by light water, cooled by light water. They're either pressurized system or boiling water systems. Uh, really grew out of GE or Westinghouse designs. Um, you have the AP-1000, which is the Westinghouse design that's being built in Georgia, as well as uh, across the world in China, for example. Um, I have mentioned Vogel 3 and 4 in Georgia that are being constructed as we speak. Um, as we go to the GE, the you have a, the GE brings forward the boiling water reactor. Those are operating currently. They have, an, they have a, a new design that's also being marketed. The interesting continuum of innovation is going to small and modular. So small in the sense that a lot of these plants are gigawatt scale, big, big, big plants. Small in the sense of think about modules that are more like 60 megawatts electric or even smaller, and I'll talk about even smaller. And also modular, modular in construction and also modular in operations with the hope of getting down the cost curve. Uh, first of a kind, probably still quite expensive, uh, but the hope being that with time they'll get down and be competitive, say, with, say, natural gas and renewables. Um, we've got ways to go there. Uh, they've got to build first of a kind. They're going to be expensive. We'll talk, we can talk about how the government's, what the government role is in doing that. Uh, and I'll talk more about that as I go through as well. Um, 
These are also the new scale. The new scale is the most, the, the, the most uh, uh, one that you hear about the most company. It's a light water reactor system. They're based out of Corvallis, Oregon. It was actually a spinoff of Oregon State University. They're a company that's marketing a light water small modular reactor that would be built in 6 and 12 pack 12 modules, about 60 megawatts each. Uh, they're looking to build, and I'll talk more about this, they're first of a kind on our site. Um, we hope by 2026. And they're also actively looking to export that design across, across the globe as well. Heavy, heavy government involvement in getting the debt first of a kind. Uh, obviously, heavy government involvement back in the 50s and 60s to get to the current fleet as well. Uh, so, so with nuclear, it, it's bound to have a lot of federal government involvement. It's high risk. It takes time. Uh, and, and, and so there's important questions about what does the partnership look like, particularly go forward between the government and the private sector to enable, to, to enable advanced nuclear. So when I say advanced nuclear, I include light water systems like New Scale in that. But then when you go beyond that, you go to other kinds of coolants. Now, this is a little bit of back to the future because we've, we've built sodium fast reactors, for example, liquid metal cooled, so, sodium cooled fast reactors in the United States before. Uh, we've built high temperature gas reactors. We've built molten salt reactors. These are, these, so we're going back to some of those non-light water coolants. Um, again, a lot of modularity. A lot of them are small and modular. So small and modular isn't just a light water system. It can be applied to a variety of different coolants. And I'll talk more about this, but there's a large, there's been a large expansion of the number of companies that are US based that are starting to develop some of these advanced non light water reactor concepts, including some, quite frankly, startups. Uh, one over here in Sunnyville, Oklo, has a very small reactor that, that I'll talk more about. Um, a lot of them have spun out of universities as opposed to labs. And, and the interesting thing is, is a lot of them tend to be younger folks who have come out and are, are, are trying to think about nuclear as a part of the solution to climate change. So there's this interesting shift in the conversation. But what's the role of the government in helping enable those? And I'll talk more about that. So there's this innovation that's happening. So you have, if you think about it from the US perspective, we had leadership back here. Now you've got other countries marketing these machines and also, uh, also developing a lot of advanced non-light water reactors. I would suggest to you that it, when I show you the innovations that are going on in the United States, we have an opportunity to put ourselves back in a leadership position if we're very thoughtful about how we develop and export some of those technologies. Because a lot of, I think, what's going to get built isn't going to be in the United States. It's going to be probably internationally. And so then that gets back into the export control regime and things that I know this room thinks a lot about. And how do you think about US export of nuclear technologies, particularly things that are considered dual use? So an important part of the, of the, of the future for nuclear, in my opinion, in our opinion, is thinking about it as an integrated system. So we've always thought about it as electricity only focus. Uh, you all, I think, are very aware that if we're serious about deep decarbonization, uh, you're going to have to, the electricity sector is easy in a relative sense. Transportation sector is hard. The industrial sector is even harder. Uh, so you've got to really deeply think about what does that integrated system look like. And I would submit to you that there's going to be a very, very strong role in an expansion of renewables go forward. But I would suggest that if we're serious about deep decarbonization, you've got to think about nuclear and advanced nuclear as part of the value proposition. And then there's interesting research questions about what does that look like? What are the processes that go into, uh, say, producing hydrogen, for example, uh, using process heat for nuclear to produce other products? Uh, how tightly coupled is that system? How does storage fit in, uh, energy storage fit in of various sorts, compressed air, thermal storage, batteries, fuel cells, all these interesting technology selections and questions. And what the labs are doing is we're simply providing options. Uh, we don't, the markets will make these decisions. Uh, but the labs and the universities are responsible for doing that research, doing that development, and, and being a part of demonstrating these advanced systems as well. But there's really interesting systems levels questions about how tightly coupled does the system need to be. Uh, the 2050 energy system will look quite different than the energy system does today. Uh, so what is the role of nuclear in that? So it, given our role in, in the, as a leadership, as a lab and leader in nuclear energy, we obviously approach it from that perspective. 
We've got strong collaborations with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, in Golden, Colorado, who focuses a lot on renewables. Uh, so we're working very closely with them to think about, okay, if you think about this future energy system, what does it look like? Nuclear and renewables working together, for example. Uh, and then we're bringing in the National Energy Technology Laboratory, because if you think about the role of, say, what we hope is clean fossil, if we can figure out capture and sequestration, do it economically, is there a role for natural gas, coal, and in particular natural gas, uh, go, go forward in, into the future. So one of the things as an applied lab, one of the things we're doing, this happens to be a picture of one of our, one of our laboratories, one of our high bay areas. We, we, we're actually putting in place a test bed. So we can mock up a thermal system that's basically processing from a nuclear reactor. We have fast charging infrastructure. We have battery testing. We have grid emulation. That grid emulation, that, that real-time digital simulation connects to NREL, to other laboratories, connects to the utilities. And we can actually basically mock up a pilot of what an integrated energy system might look like. And so we're just in the final process of, of getting funding from the Department of Energy to build that test bed. And we're working closely with our partner laboratories to actually implement that. The interesting thing here is this will allow, say, the utilities to come in and do interesting testing with us, uh, do analysis and testing using this as a test bed uh, that the government funds. So talked a little bit about the existing fleet. Let's talk about the, the future. So an interesting development uh, that's actually been very recent, uh, that's become very public, is, is, is the prospect of what I'll call microreactors. So when I say small, think 50, 60 megawatt modules. Uh, micro or very small, think 2 to 20 megawatts. Very, very small reactors. I mentioned the company Oklo over in Sunnyvale. They are, they're, they're marketing a sodium-cooled fast reactor that's very small. Uh, where does that fit? Could potentially power remote area, remote Canada, remote Alaska, one example. Um, it could get cost competitive in remote Canada real quick because they're subsidizing diesel in Canada. So you can get nuclear to be cost competitive very quickly because they're subsidizing diesel for diesel generators up in that, in that, part, of the, in that part of the world. Um, the military in the U.S., the Department of Defense, is now getting very, very interested. Just a couple weeks ago, they released a request for information. They're now interested in pursuing microreactor technology uh, for not only for military bases, but also for forward operating areas. So when the Department of Defense gets interested, that brings urgency and, and resources. So we're imagine, there's actually active discussions about potentially demonstrating one of these microreactor technologies, potentially using our site, and then they would deploy it to military installations uh, in other places as early as the early 20s. So aggressive. Um, the many of the technologies that we're looking at are, are, are fairly mature. Um, so that's an interesting development that we're actively working with the Department of Defense. I already mentioned the small modular reactors that are the new scale design that, are, that they're working with a utility consortium in the West called the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems. Uh, they're looking to first deploy on the, on the Idaho National Laboratory site by 2026. So very long time frames, things nuclear. The microreactor deployment could be, again, more accelerated because they're simpler designs, they're smaller systems. And because you bring the military to the table, the Department of Defense to the table as a customer, that could accelerate. Um, I'll talk more about the test bed aspect and the operating test reactor, so I won't touch on this. The versatile test reactor, uh, I'll, ta I'll talk about that in, a future, in, in, in one of my next slides. But then I talked about the non-light water reactor systems, the high temperature gas reactors, the molten salt reactors, as, as well as uh, sodium fast reactors, lead cooled fast reactors a lot of different systems that are out there. Uh, very aggressive time frames, but some companies are talking about working with the government to try to demonstrate those technologies by 2030. Idea being you demonstrate them in the US, and in many cases, you're deploying globally. Um, so this is a very uh, rosy, I would say, aggressive timeline. This is what we're working to. Um, and, and I would say not, all of this is not going to happen. Uh, but we're working towards trying to make as much of it happen as possible. The government resources that require this are significant. The federal government resources are significant. So that, that in and of itself is a challenge uh, that, that we face. So I've mentioned the microreactors. On, the, on, on your right are some of, the, some of the companies that are out there, are out there designing and actually marketing these microreactor designs. 
Uh, again, the requirement set, particularly for deployment for a Department of Defense application, are unique. Uh, they need to be, as my words, walk away safe. You need to be able to transport these, uh, say on a C-17, for example, uh, break them down and put them back together in a week and have them generating electricity and perhaps process heat for other applications. So a very interesting requirement set that's developing out of the Department of Defense uh, that's, that's being actively worked. But these companies, some of these companies, uh, Westinghouse, for example, has a very, very, have, has a very small reactor design that they're, that they're starting to market. I mentioned Oaklo. Uh, General Atomics uh, down in San Diego has, has a high temperature gas reactor design. So there's companies, all these companies will likely respond to the Department of Defense opportunity. We're working with all of them to help them mature their designs. So you'll hear more and more, I think, about this development, whereas two years ago, this wasn't really on our radar to any significant ex extent. I've, I've talked quite a bit about the small modular reactors. Um, so so one, of the, one of the things that I'll mention is why, why is this uh, consortium of municipal utilities in the Mountain West interested? Uh, the CEO says publicly because he views it as a hedge he views it as a hedge because he think, he's banking on someday there being a price on carbon. So he's got aging coal. So the conversation, the decision he has to make with his municipal utility partners is, do I build new natural gas or do I build nuclear? That's still, he hasn't decided that. They haven't decided that yet. So they're actively in the conversation about whether they do, in fact, construct these SMRs, these small modular reactors on our site or not. That decision has not been made. But again, it's all about a hedge on carbon as they view it out in the late 20s into the 30s, they feel like they have to have something that is not coal. So, so that's, that's the argument. They operate a lot of renewables as well for their, for the, for their, for their partners as well. So, so we'll see if this happens. This, there's business decisions that have to be made. The new scale design has not yet been certified by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's about halfway through that process. It's making progress, but it's not, it's not complete. Another thing that the government can provide is fuel. So, so one of the things that, you're, that those of you follow nuclear, you know low enriched uranium versus high enriched uranium. This room probably knows that well. Uh, there's a term being thrown around called HALU, high SA low enriched uranium. What is that? That is because a lot of these advanced reactor designs are looking for enrichments. So the current fleet, low enriched uranium, 3 to 5 percent enriched, 235 over 238 as, as mined out of the ground. Um, high SALEU pushes it all the way up to 19, 19 and a half, even a little bit higher, up close to the 20% limit that trips you from LEU, from low enriched to high enriched uranium. Many of these companies are looking for HALU to, operate, to, to fuel their reactors. So there's inherently a government role there to provide that material. How do you provide it? Well, you could reestablish domestic enrichment and, 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 and enrich to to those levels and produce fuel that way. Uh, the, gov the federal government's recently announced that they're, they're going to they're, they're at least go to the pilot scale to try to start to develop that capability. Um, you, could actually you could actually treat Navy fuel uh, and, and, and extract, uh, extract HU, downblend that to a high SA low enriched uranium. Or in, a, in the case of ours, we have some spent fuel that we're processing from past reactors. We could accelerate that reprocessing and generate some material as well. But as the companies out there are thinking about these designs, they're looking to the government to produce, provide this material. So what's the government done? Um, during the Obama administration, it was recognized that if we're serious about getting to advanced nuclear, we've got to accelerate the way that we do it. So we rolled out an initiative under the Obama administration called GAIN, the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear. What does that mean? That means how do we provide better access of the industry to the laboratory's capabilities? And how do we try to accelerate the innovation timeline to get to uh, demonstration and deployment? So we put together a consortium that was the labs. There's government money going into now helping to seed some of these ideas that are coming from the private sector. A lot of this is early stage work. So when the big bucks come in is when you you down-select, however that happens, and you have to go demonstrate some of these machines. That's when you get into the billions, the hundreds of millions, the billions of dollars. And what does the partnership look like between the private sector and the government that will make that happen? That's TBD. That's the conversation that we're in right now. 
but we deliver a test bed. So we deliver research re reactors. We deliver capabilities to look at fuels and materials, work with them to fig companies to help to design their fuel, figure out how to fabricate their fuel, test their fuel. Um, but we also could provide as a government site, and INL would be an example, a place to demonstrate their, their, their technologies. So you can see this full sort of uh, government, government support from early stage all the way out to demonstration and even deployment. So New Scale, the SMR on INL, could be an example of a uh, first example of demonstration on a government site. We're talking to other companies, some are public uh, as well. Uh, we're also working with some companies in the early stage. TerraPower, that's, a, that's one that many hear about because of Bill Gates. Bill Gates is, is financing TerraPower, chair of their board. Um, they have a, they have a, fast, they have a, a sodium cooled fast reactor concept that, that they were hoping to actually deploy first deployment in China. With some of the dialogue between right now, they're actually having to back off on that because of the policy discu discussions that are going on in Washington. So there's active discussion, and you're reading in a, probably a lot about it in the papers. He's having to take a step back. He and the company are taking a step back. Maybe they deploy first in the US, perhaps. Uh, we, for example, are working very closely with them to help them design their fuel and also fabricate their fuel, we at INL. But if you look at the ability of the labs, the, broadly the labs, so the labs to deliver test, test capabilities to the private sector. These are, many, these are examples of what's at INL. Oak Ridge has capabilities as well. Uh, Argonne has capabilities as well that support the civil nuclear sector. We still operate the advanced test reactor, which is a thermal spectrum test reactor that supports the nuclear Navy mission in particular, uh, but is also supporting industry as well as National Lab and University research. Uh, we operate a, another small neutron radiography machine at INL. Um, we, we just restarted the tra a transient test reactor. So, so this is a steady state machine, produces a lot of neutrons in the thermal spectrum, irradiates fuels and materials, important part of the mission. But if you think about a reactor, it, it, during a severe accident, it could undergo significant power transients. So this is a, the treat reactor, the transient test reactor was shut down in 1994. Post Fukushima, the Department of Energy made the decision to restart that machine. So the response to Fukushima was, on the research side, was to develop accident tolerant fuels in partnership with industry, as well as restart this transient testing capability. We just restarted it about a year ago. Um, it's really a one of a kind machine uh, that, that produces this kind of capability. There's a sh machine in Europe that, that, is a, that produces similar kinds of transients. So the treat and that machine are really the only ones in the world that can produce these kinds of testing. So you can test fuels in steady state, but you have to ultimately take it to these transients to truly understand what would happen if they fail. These are thermal spectrum machines. What's missing in the United States is a fast spectrum test reactor. So part of the bipartisan discussion that's going on in Washington, there's been two laws that have been signed by the president in the past six months. Uh, the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act was signed into law in September, and the Nuclear Energy Innovation Modernization Act was signed into law just a couple weeks ago. What did that do? It, 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 enabled, it enabled a lot of what I'm talking about in the innovation space, authorized a lot of what I'm talking about in the innovation space for advanced reactors. Test reactor, the ability to use government sites to demonstrate, setting up mechanisms for power purchase agreements between the government and the private sector to perhaps enable advanced reactors. Streamlining the regulatory process. I emphasize these are all authorization. They're the, so so they, they authorize, but they don't appropriate. So a lot of what we're talking about here would require significant appropriations in the out years to enable a lot of what I'm talking about in terms of the future. But there's a, there's a gap in terms of a missing, we do, we do not in the United States have the ability to produce a fact spectrum for testing of fuels and materials anymore. If a company wants to test, for example, TerraPower, they go to Russia. Um, Arguably, that's not necessarily what the United States would view as a sustainable situation. So we've been authorized to explore the design for a fast test reactor that would likely be constructed at INL. That's not been decided. We're just approaching mission need for that. So it's early days, uh, but we're in the process of, of working with industry. We've signed a contract with Jihi Itachi and Bechtel to work with us as, as an AE to help us mature that design over the course of the next 18 to 24 months. 
Modeling and simulation is really an important part of that. Um, what, what, the, what, the, what labs like Oak Ridge and Argonne and the weapons labs bring to the table in terms of compute power, but also computational science and engineering expertise. Uh, we're growing ours as well. But the ability to actually think about how you still have to validate these models with tests. But the ability to use advanced modeling and simulation to perhaps be a part of accelerating that innovation timeline, working with the regulator to bring those advanced tools uh, to bear to actually hopefully accelerate innovation. Uh, many government funded programs in this space. A lot of the understanding that, that went into stockpile stewardship for the nuclear weapons program translated over to thinking about the civil nuke sector. So a lot of that's been translated over. The weapons labs are heavily involved in helping us think through this. Also, the ability to bring all the universities, other labs, but in particular the universities, uh, and bring grad students, postdocs, faculty to the table to work with the labs to use these facilities. Um, and a lot of the ideas that are coming out for advanced reactor concepts, they're coming from the universities. They're coming from the young people. And so continue to think about how we seed that, seed that innovation. I would suggest to you that the United States, while the civil nuclear sector, the supply value chain on the private sector side has eroded, I would suggest to you that the labs and universities are still world leading in this space. And so therein lies an opportunity. But we have to take, we have to take advantage of that. So one of the other things that the, the laws that have been signed has, has authorized is the creation of a National Reactor Innovation Center, which is, is again, using government sites to demonstrate advanced reactor concepts. Uh, we think Idaho is an important part of that. I talked about our history. It's 890 square miles if you've been out there. It's 890 square miles of desert, a lot of open space, a state that in general, we can talk about this in discussion, in general is very supportive of nuclear, as long as cleanup progresses, it continues to progress. Uh, so we've got a lot of support across the state with the governor, with the legislature to pursue if companies are serious about demonstrating the U.S. and then ultimately ex exporting across the globe, uh, they, they could use our site as that place. And so we're in active discussion with several companies, some public, some, some not yet public. And then it's all about the next generation. I already mentioned um, the university programs that the government funds the NRC, the Department of Energy, the Office of Science, uh, Office of Nuclear Energy within DOE, um, uh, need to continue to think about how that works. Uh, the, the labs are, are, are great for bringing interns in, uh, bringing postdocs in. In our case, I will tell you, when I got to INL, our postdoc program and our grad student intern program was quite small. I had come from Argonne National Laboratory in Los Alamos, very robust postdoc programs and grad student programs. Uh, Idaho didn't have that history, so we're trying to grow that program at INL as well. But that's a really, really important part. The labs, the labs play an important role in that, in bringing, in bringing along that, that next generation. So what needs to be done? A lot needs to be done. I've talked about improvements to the licensing process. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the U.S. is truly the gold standard in terms of the, tech, the regulatory framework and the technical basis. But arguably, it takes time, and there are companies that are developing U.S. technologies that are looking to, for example, license in Canada because they, their opinion is that it can be done faster in Canada. Um, so there does need to be improvements to the licensing process in the United States. I've talked about the erosion of the supply and value chain in the U.S. The nuclear Navy still has a supply and value chain, but it's not what it was in the 50s and 60s. And so we would have to, at some level, reconstruct that, but also think globally as we think about the supply and value chain. I've mentioned the public-private partnerships. If we're serious about demonstrating advanced systems, what does that partnership look like? And where do the resources come from? Um, these are in the billions when you talk about demonstrating these technologies. So it's a significant outlay. Uh, what is the role of the utility? What's the role of the vendor? What's the role of the government? And then finally, policies. And what do I mean by that? You know, ideally, you get a price on carbon. To me, then that drives the right conversation to me in the energy space about what needs to be done uh, go forward. Uh, you, but you know, there, there's now talk in Washington. This administration has introduced a conversation about how do you price reliability and resilience. I'm not going to defend the details, but it drives an interesting conversation about the importance. How do you quantify that? How do you think about it? What is the role of renewables? What's the role of nuclear? What's the role of natural gas in what needs to be a clean, reliable, and resilient? energy system. 
So there's important policy conversations that have to happen as well. And I think I'm going to stop there and hopefully have a lot of discussion. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. We'll sit. So I'll start with a few questions. Uh, All right, I'll start with a few questions and have a discussion with Mark. Then we'll open it up first to the CSAC fellows and then to the entire audience. Um, so Mark, the, you know, you've described uh, a path toward advanced reactors, both modular and also larger. Um, you also pointed out that um, you're talking about extended time frames. But if we look at the carbon cycle, the carbon cycle, as it's related to uh, climate change, has us on a pretty tight schedule. Yep. And so how does nuclear develop in a way to impact the carbon cycle in a timely way? So I, I would say first, Let's talk about the existing fleet first. Mm -hmm. I, I think you have to think about the existing fleet as a part of that. Right. Because if you have premature, my words, they, the industry likes to call it premature retirements. If you have retirements now, that, 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 has a, that, that can have a profound impact in the, near, in the near term. But, well, arguably it's too late to meet Paris goals anyway, no matter right. what, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, it is too late. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, to me... You're not going to have substantial new nuclear in the U.S. You wouldn't have it in time to, to, to address the U.S. component of, say, meeting Paris goals. Over the long term, I think it needs to be a part of it, but, but you're not going to be able to use it to, in, in the near term, I would argue. The globe, the global expansion is a different conversation. Their countries are actively looking at building new nuclear now that will help them meet their goals. Chinese, for example, are building nuclear very aggressively. Um, right, but with the Chinese, as I understand the figures, they will still only push to about 4% of their electricity being generated by a very expanded nuclear program. Yes. So is it worth it? Um, I, I would argue, I would argue it, it, if you take the near-term <laughs> view, if you're, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't price out. Mm -hmm. But so, if you take the long-term view, I would argue if you're serious about in the long term keeping greenhouse, continuing to minimize greenhouse gas emissions and also make it a reliable, resilient system, you need to think about nuclear as a part of it. But it's not going to enter, it's not going to be meaningful in the near term for mm -hmm. meeting Paris goals. And near term is on what scale? I would say appreciable, even 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 in the most optimistic mm -hmm. scenarios. Significant build outs in the in the twenty thirties into to twenty forty, if not beyond. Okay. You wouldn't in in my readings, uh, I mean twenty thirty is soon. It is. So uh, and looking at the uh, roadmaps for some of the advanced nuclear reactors, that's uh, into the distant future, well beyond uh, let's say a tipping point for, for climate change. Is that a a fair summary? Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. I mean, most of the companies would tell you that they could probably get first demonstration, first deployment in the 2030 time frame, mm -hmm. Rod, mm -hmm. to your point. So you're reading, the, you're reading it accurately. Okay. And so, and so, so, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 does, it does not help you in the near term. I, there's just, the, the time frames are just too long. Right. So uh, thinking about that and looking around the world for examples, of course, it's common to point to China and, and uh, France and countries that have aggressive uh, nuclear programs. But one could also look to Germany, where their energy vendor policy is to move forward without nuclear and the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Do you think that will be possible? Um, I, I, I think they're showing that the cost of electricity is actually going up right. as they right. phase out uh, nuclear. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps that settles with time, uh, but right now it's going up. Um, 
I, I, I'm, I'm not follow, I don't follow Germany's greenhouse gas emissions close enough to be able to answer your question intelligently. But I, I would argue that it's a, it's, if you weigh reliability, resilience, and cost along with clean, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to imagine them phasing out nuclear and meeting all those attributes. Well, of course, uh, looking at the policy, I think they've accepted the fact that the cost of yeah. not u using nuclear will be higher for their electricity. And as a country right. and culture, uh, that's at least for the moment been, it, been accepted. But then the other question is how much of how much are they buying nuclear electricity from France as part of right. this? Right, right. Uh, and, 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 and again, and I'll get out of my depth real quick, but you, you see different opinions on that. Yeah, right. But uh, I just bring it up because I think uh, uh, looking around the world, we have some grand experiments going on, both with the expansion of nuclear, but also uh, with uh, uh, countries like Germany uh, trying to get along without. And uh, we, I hope we'll learn uh, from all of these experiments. Yeah, and, and, and I would also bring up Japan, right? So yeah. Japan, post Fukushima, they shut them all down. Mm -hmm. And they're slowly restarting them, right. but but that's a different kind of experiment, and and they're 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 importing a lot of natural natural gas, and so that's a different kind of experiment. So and both were responses to Fukushima. Mm -hmm. So and this will be my last question, and we'll open it up to others. But uh, you discussed infrastructure, um, particularly at the labs. It's ancient; it goes back to the fifties and. Uh, um, the, the, the early days uh, of nuclear energy, nuclear research. So if the U.S. embraced um, uh, nuclear power as a long-term and important contributor, can you speak to the question of what would be the scale of that effort? Because it goes way beyond just building nuclear power plants. We, we need a nuclear workforce. We need uh, reactors at universities, probably. Um, our capabilities for just studying spent fuel are actually right. quite limited. Right. So what would be the scale of that expansion? Um, in dollars. Yeah, that's a good measure. So, 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 <laughs> so, so right now, the research and development budget for things nuclear, and I'll, I'll include the Office of, Sci the Office of Science mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in this, is order roughly one, one and a half billion. Right. Plus or minus. So that would include infrastructure investment, keeping the, keeping the test reactors running, um, safeguarding the materials, and all the research. And so, so maybe one and a half, 1 1.6, if you, and then you, you include the research university programs in mm -hmm. that. It needs to be double. Even double is modest. Don't yeah, but it yeah. would at least need to be double. Right. The labs okay. have sat down and thought about what would this need to look like to make that right. make that happen. Right. And it's double. Okay. But the, you you could argue that's modest. I, well, comparing it to the cost of dealing with legacy waste, uh, that's yeah. that's modest. Yeah. No. You know? No. Good point. It, it, but let me be clear. So so it's double for the research and development. Mm -hmm. The demonstration part. Isn't in that it isn't necessarily in that number because right. it, let's say a utility comes to me and says uh, southern company comes to me and says I want to build a I want to work with you and the federal government to build a high temperature gas reactor. That's a three or four billion dollar investment over ten to twelve years. Okay. All right. So I've satisfied my curiosity with a few questions. So let's open it up first to the fellows. Uh, uh, please. And identify yourself. Thank you very much for your remarks. My name is Fiona Cunningham. I'm a CSAC postdoctoral fellow uh, on the social science side of the house. And so my question relates to um, the role of international partners in this future of nuclear energy that you have laid out. Um, do you count foreign labs and companies among collaborators or more among competitors in the current um, kind of situation of developing some of these technologies and, and options, and ideally for maintaining the US's edge or uh, leadership in nuclear energy, um, is it more desirable to be leading competitively or collaboratively in this space? Uh, collaboratively? Uh, for, for sure. Uh, so so the, the lab collaborations 
are very, very, very active. So they're all controlled by the multilateral and bilateral frameworks that y'all are familiar with. But we have strong collaborations with, in the nuclear space, with the UK, with Canada, with the French, uh, with the European Union more broadly as well, um, South Korea, uh, China and Russia as well. Th those politically are a little bit more complicated now, as you can imagine. But there's active collaboration. So in a lot of those re advanced reactor concepts, we have active working groups uh, between the countries because, for example, the Chinese are exploring all those concepts. Uh, and they're going to demonstrate all of them in the near term. So it's, it's, co it's, it's collaborative. Now, when you think about the, from the industry perspective, the U.S. industry would tell you it's competitive because they're competing for export market, basically, with, with those. And then, then you get into the, the China and Russia model versus the U.S. model and the nation, you know, separation of industry and the government's harder in, in those instances. So when the U.S. is trying to, a U.S. set of companies are trying to, say, sell a reactor in Saudi Arabia, they would view it as a strong competition. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Others? Maxine? Uh, Maxim Polary, Priyadoc, Philo at CSAC, uh, who's been working on the Fukushima nuclear disaster. I was wondering, how do you think that the small uh, nuclear modular reactor are going to change issues of uh, nuclear security? Like on the one hand, if a uh, disaster happened, it might be on a much more s a smaller scale than former nuclear disaster. And at the same time, I cannot help to think that it might be much more easier for terrorists to gain access to a small modular reactor lost in the north of Saskatchewan or in Alaska than former uh, big uh, nuclear reactor in the States. Thanks. Yeah, so, this, so the safety aspect of it, the source term aspect of it, are, they're smaller. And so the source term is naturally smaller. So you don't have as much of a, a, a uh, acreage to have, to have to manage from that perspective. Um, so that, that's, that's a benefit. Um, a lot of the systems are, the fuel types and whatnot, are very resistant to, to uh, potential uh, handling in a, in a way that you could divert the, mater you could divert the material for other, other uses. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a given that they're having to think very carefully about the security of the systems because of the potential for diversion, because you're right, they're smaller. Uh, so, but the fuel types are also viewed as tolerant to that and whatnot, and, and probably can't talk a whole lot more about some of this. But they're developing designs that are, that are more tolerant to that. But, but th they use the word walk away safe. I mean, these, but that's not in the security sense. That's in a safety sense. So let's be clear on that. So I think this is an active, the security aspect is a very active conversation. But, if, but, if you, but they are walk away safe in the sense that many of, the, many of them are, 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 are physics, physics works, works in your favor, right? They, they shut down automatically, so-called passive safety. I should also say many of them, they're looking at autonomous control, uh, which gets into cybersecurity type stuff. Uh, so there, there's a lot of security questions that I think we face as you think about some of these advanced systems, because they're talking about shrinking control room, operation size, and even autonomous functions. Interesting research questions, actually, in the security space. Hey, Francois. Hi, uh, Mark. Uh, François Yesmorin. So I am a uh, nuclear security visiting scholar here at CSAC. And <clears throat> I used to work in the US nuclear industry and in France as well on the design of the EPR. Um, so I will challenge a little bit that view, optimist view, starting with a vision that is actually a pretty old slide that I used to see like 10 years ago already. The only thing that changes are the dates on it. But <laughs> And when you showed that, you mentioned that it will require a lot of funding from the government. Yeah. And we don't live only in a carbon-constrained world, but also in a budget-constrained world, right? And I would see that the vision for energy transition will have to match somewhat or involve more maybe the public. Like, there is a popular movement for uh, renewable energy at the moment. 
with its limits, but the popular movement is here and demanding for changes, right? And on the, in the nuclear business, I don't see any popular movement. You have environmentalists in think tanks doing this kind of thing, but I don't see, and there have never see, uh, been a popular movement on that. So how do you, uh, if a national lab is providing options, why aren't you just trying to provide options for the public as well, and not only for the government? in first the whole strategy for the nuclear fuel cycle and also in terms of energy uses and production, maybe at different scales. So, so Roel, I don't, by the way, I don't dispute, I, I take your criticism that, that it's the same picture, the dates just changed. I take, I, I mean, you're right, because I could have given, in many respects, that talk in 2005 and it would have been, it would have been similar. I would suggest to you that, that the difference that I see anyway is, is the conversation about climate change is different than it was, than it was then. And, and, and I think the, the role of nuclear in that, notwithstanding Rod's point about does it, does it happen fast enough, has changed the dynamic. Um, I'm struck by the, the, some, some of the environmental movement who've come around to, to, that, to that realization. And I've been in this, running around this world for 20, 25 years, and, and I, I didn't see that 10, 15 years ago. So that would be the distinction. So, may, so I, of course, I'd like to say that's the last time I'm ever going to show this and the dates are going to change, but then I, if I'm here 10 years from now, I do it again, I'm a liar, right? Um, but but, but, but I, 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 to me, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it now or we're not going to do it. That's, that's the way I look at it. I mean, it's either part of the solution or it's not. And so, so I'm not avoiding your other... Your other, your other point. So you're basically saying rather than us providing options, we provide options for the government effectively, that we should also be engaged socially? Yeah. No argument. That's not really our role. Uh, but, 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 uh, but to me, we, we're an important part of talking about the technology in public. Um, and so we have a role there. But it's, there's, a, there's only so far that we go when, we, when you get into that space. Uh, to me, that, that gets into what the university's roles are, for example, in, in more, more than a laboratory. Um, I will say that we're spending a lot of time talking about this to our public in, in, in Idaho. So I personally spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, but in general, to your point, there, there's, not, there's, not a, there's not a movement like you see with renewables. Why is that? Why do you think that is? You've been, in the, you've been in the space for a long time. I mean. Yeah, I can tell you. Well, I think the people are more skeptical about the decision-making rather than just the technology itself. So when you get this kind of just optimistic view, I think you are just missing a point in trying to convince back people because people know the negative feedback that the nuclear industry has, has lived with right. and the failures of uh, trying to go for fast reactors and other types. So they know it very well. If you are not presenting them to them in full disclosure, I think that the trust is not really built. So you, you would argue give them a more, give them a more. A fair and balanced view, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this wasn't fair and balanced. Oh, no, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I said up front it wasn't going to be, I said it was going to yeah, be optimistic, yeah. yeah. It's okay. Full disclosure. <laughs> So it wasn't fair and balanced because I, I, I disclosed it, though. Well, yeah. you know, for instance, when you show the number of new reactors built, yeah. it's one way of showing it. But you could have shown the installed capacity in gigawatt per yeah, year, yeah, right? Fair enough, fair and enough. at the moment, Ukraine yeah. Urban Energy is yeah, yeah. beating the nuclear yep, power industry yep, yep, by yep, far. Yep. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. so, so there's interest. Yeah, so, so I'm a labby, so maybe that's, I'm not the right guy to do the fair and balanced. But... Uh, but it's it's a it's a good it's a good it's good feedback, but there there are people who are thinking a lot about how to how how to change the conversation. The ones in the United States that I think are getting it are doing a good job. At, there's an organization called Third Way, based out of Washington, that's starting to try to have the right conversation. Um, but we're an echo chamber, as well. I would say the the, our, the, the nuclear community, we talk to ourselves, a lot. <laughs> Seriously, we're, we, you get, we get together and we, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a love in, uh, and we don't do a good job, uh, do a good job of talking to others. So, good point. I should point out that Mark is a 
earth scientist in his origins. So he's not, uh, he not didn't convinced. grow up in the, the nuclear community, although he's an eloquent spokesman uh, for it. Um, and I think that that piece of information is important to, to tuck away. Other questions from the fellows? At the back, is there a fellow? Oh, Herb. It's Herb. Okay. Last call for fellows. Okay, Herb. You briefly alluded to the role of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in, in, in all of this. Um, and I was hoping that you would say <coughs> more. My understanding of the way in which the Nuclear Regulatory Commission can actually operate these days is that it couldn't certify any of these new reactors under any circumstances. The only thing it knows how to certify is, is the, you know, so the old stuff that, that we have lots of already. Um, so I think my, my question is how and to what extent are you trying to help the NRC uh, get into a better position for being able to ag actually evaluate the safety of these reactors uh, when it comes time to actually deploy them. So there's act. Yeah, you're 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 right, Herb. It's it's they don't have the technical capability to look at anything but light water. That's a that's a generalization, but it's a true statement. Um, and and so what we're doing is DOE is actually funding labs to work with the NRC to develop things like generic design criteria and whatnot for the advanced systems. So I've got folks who are actively working with the commission, the staff, not the commission, with the staff on, on that. Um, part of the authorization of the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the bill and whatnot that I mentioned was signed into law was to, was, was to authorize and hopefully start to appropriate. They're already getting some money off fee. So the way the NRC operates is mostly they collect fees off the utility. That's, that's, it's cost recovery. Uh, but they're getting direct appropriations to, to, to start to work in this space as well. And that will allow them to start to hire people. Um, and then in, in the case of some of the test machines, if we do move forward with them, even though they may be licensed <coughs> by the DOE directly, there's going to be a cooperation where we'll bring their people in to be a part of the licensing process. So there's, they're trying different stuff. So there's active, at this point, there's active intercourse between, That's the, correct. between the lab, the DOE, and the NRC. That's correct. Bring their level, up, uh, yeah. level of expertise up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but also what you did, that, that's the expertise piece. What you didn't talk about is going to a more modern framework meaning it's a very deterministic framework that they operate under. Uh, so going to more, the buzzword is risk-informed performance-based, but right, you understand this kind of thing. Uh, so, so part of it is to revamp the framework to be able to take that more risk-informed and performance-based approach. That gets into being able to use advanced, model, advanced modeling and simulation, different kinds of codes. Uh, the NRC may not be able to maintain their own set of codes anymore. They may we may have to share codes. How do you do that and maintain their independence? those kinds of questions. There's cultural issues associated with that. This cur the current commission and Chairman Savinicki, she's, she's very motivated to drive culture change in that, in that area, but it, that's going to take time too. And also revamping the licensing process. Some of these companies are startups and they live from raise to raise. So how do you get the licensing process to fit with, with I'll call it a, more of a sort of a VC model for some of these companies? That's, that, that's why they're going to Canada because there's a different, different approach. So all these things are all in the mix and actively being worked. Is, is it your sense that the technology from a time scale is longer or shorter than the regulatory time scales? Uh, the technology time scales are shorter than the regulatory time scales. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right, Arun? So, um, the microphone's oh. coming. So, <coughs> I want to get your thoughts on the techno-economics of it. I couldn't agree more with you that maintaining the current fleet so that they don't go out of business is one of the best ways to reduce carbon emissions. Otherwise, your carbon emissions shoot up, right. which we have seen in the United States. Right. So, um, and the reason they're going out of business is because the wholesale price of electricity is being brought down with low marginal cost wind and solar. and cheap natural gas. Right. And so the construction cost was high enough that 
the margins for nuclear, even though they get adopted in the market, the margins are too low, right, right to pay for the loans and things like that. So if that's the case, uh, right now what we learned in South Carolina uh, plants is that they were costing north of $8 a watt. That's right. Right? Yeah. On the other hand, the ones that are viable in the world today are South Korean reactors, which are about 3 to $4 a watt. It's great to see New Scale and the other startup companies and all do that. Given the NRC, we just talked about that, do they have a shot at the Nth plant, not the first one, to get to 3 to $4 a watt? Because if they don't, certainly no one's going to build an AP1000 now in the United States. Yeah. But the new reactors that people are so hopeful for, will they ever get to 3 or $4 a watt? Because if they don't, they're not going to make it either. So yeah. what's your thought on that? Yeah, so, so I, don't, I don't have a... There's a lot of these companies that have designs, quite frankly, that are really on paper. And they're, they have the promise of getting to that kind of 3 to $4 a watt. Until we, until we go to first of a kind, I, 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 I don't hard even, I, it's hard to tell. And someone has to pay for it. And you're saying the government or maybe the first buyer is the Department of Defense, which we always thought. With the microsystems, maybe they are. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 the way the public-private partnership needs to be wired together is an interesting, interesting question. I, I, and that's the conversation that we're not having, to me. That's the, that's the elephant in the room. To go to demonstration, you've, so it isn't just, oh, it's a 50-50 cost share, it's an 80-20 cost share. You've you got to think about, you know, there's all kinds of ways to think about it, right? Is there PPAs involved? Do, do you, do you, does the government front it and then you pay back the government with time? All, all kinds of different questions that have to be addressed. But, I, you know, there's a lot of companies that are saying they can get to that three to four. I don't buy it. Now, I, I'll tell you that the new scale UAMP deal, they're saying they can get to 65. Sorry, I, th I think in megawatt hours. But the, sure. the, 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 they're saying, if you get me to 65, I'll build it. That's what UAMP's, that's what the utility's telling new scale. Okay, Lu Min, you had a question? Uh, I'm Lu Min Wang. Uh, a visiting scholar at the CSAC and on sabbatical from Michigan, the nuclear engineering department. Uh, you talked about this small modular reactor for the future of nuclear energy a lot, but uh, uh, one problem in, in my mind, I, I can never figure out this, you know, usually there's a, a scale factor for the cost. So are you confident that this a small modular reactor can I ever be cost effective really? compared to the large scale reactors? I, I think, I think, I think it, it, well, it sort of gets to what Arun just said. I, I almost don't know until, the, until they build. I'd, I'd like to see a 12 pack, a new scale 12 pack built and see what it actually comes in at. And then also the question is what's N? What's mm -hmm. N? Is it, is it module by module or is it plant by plant? Uh, I don't think, you know, they would claim they get through 12 pack and they're ready, they're, that's, close to N, that's close to N for them. That's their claim. But that's on paper. Yeah. Uh, if but, I may, but I've, I've, okay. the, the, the promise of modularity in construction and in oper but in construction in particular, I think has I think it's got great potential. Okay. And that's why all these companies, when you say SMR, let's be careful not to you know this, Amin. But when I say SMR, don't think new scale. A lot of these are SMRs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh, just one more if I can yeah. ask. Uh, out of the order non-light water reactor uh, designs. You know, uh, Idaho had a lot of experience on fast reactor in the past, but the national labs had experience on uh, molten salt and uh, uh, other type of uh, reactor designs. Uh, do you have uh, anything in your mind is a, a favorite, like high temperature gas cooled for the future? You mean my favorite? Uh -huh. I'm not allowed to pick. Pick winners. <laughs> no, I, I, I. It's not Congress. Yeah, that's right. No, but I you're know. being strange. Yeah, so. no, no, I know, I know. But but if you, I, I think about it from a maturity perspective. So if you think about it, I think high temperature gas is the one that's the most mature, and has the potential to penetrate penetrate beyond electricity most effectively. Personal opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, the back, please. I'm another French person, 
much older. Uh, please uh, My name is Jean-Pierre Dupuis, and I've been heading the, uh, uh, the um, Ethics Commission of the French Authority on Nuclear Safety and Security mm -hmm. for many years. We've been <coughs> working on the cases of uh, Fukushima, Chernobyl, etc. But you haven't spoken much about the um, nuclear accidents and social acceptance. Yes. I think that's at least in the case of France, which, as you know, has 75% today of its electricity produced in nuclear power plants, and it was 85% not long ago. And the goal today is to reach, under popular pressure, I would say, after Fukushima, to reach a level of 50% mm -hmm. in, okay. So we have to shut down, what's the technical term, decommission, decommission, no? Yeah. A number of, new, yeah. Uh, shut down, let's say, um, not the government, but the, um, the um, a number of um, uh, nuclear reactors. And we realize, first, that it's at least as complicated, sophisticated, etc., as to build a new reactor. Right. And secondly, that since, because of this goal, political goal, there is no prestige now, much less prestige for young people like my young colleague here to choose the nuclear track. So we, we lack competencies to shut them down. And uh, last point, it, we realize also that in the cost of nuclear electricity, nuclear electricity, we haven't taken into account the cost of the decomm decommissioning of nuclear reactors, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'd like to, your reaction about that. To, 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 all, to all those different aspects? Uh, so, so, so I guess for the, one of your points was about the young people yeah. and attracting young people. Yeah. And the accidents. And the accidents. Well, let's talk about accidents first. Uh, so so, so for, from, 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 where, from where I sit in the U.S. perspective, we've, yes, we've had... Three mile, three mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. The U.S. response, in the case of Three Mile Island, uh, the U.S., of course, created IMPO, the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations. Uh, that, that, that was a lot of things, but it, a lot of it was about the way we operate the reactors. Um, I'm going to make this very simplistic. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Chernobyl was about the design. Uh, and then Fukushima was about how we handled the safety basis and the design basis. Um, the interesting thing about the response to Fukushima, at least in the U.S., was that um, many of the improvements that were required to handle station blackout, for example, from Fukushima, were already being put in place in the U.S. because of 9-11. Because of so many things were already being done. Um, I actually got, uh, I was living in Argonne, I was working in Argonne at the time of Fukushima, and and actually ended up testifying to the state legislature quite a bit because there was a lot, as you know, there's, I think there's a lot of plants in Illinois, so there's a lot of spent fuel in Illinois. And oh, by the way, a couple of the plants that are up in the northern part of Illinois are exactly like Fukushima. Spent fuel pool hanging up on the roof. Uh, so you can imagine the legislature and others were pretty worked up. So I spent a lot of time down in Springfield at the Capitol trying to describe to them what happened, just trying to be as objective as possible. Here's what happened. And here's what's different about the way the U.S. plants are, are managed and whatnot that, that suggests that this wouldn't have happened, wouldn't have happened here. Um, but I would argue the industry has learned from the accidents, but the accidents are a big part of the, 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 the industry has not done a good job of talking to the, yeah. to the I'll call it the uninformed public about them and, the, and what we've learned. You know, IMPO got created, WANO got created after Chernobyl. Um, I think they've responded in the, in, 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 in the right way. Let's set Chernobyl, Chernobyl, Chernobyl aside. I would argue that the design at Fukushima behaved the way, the way you would have hoped it would have behaved. It didn't have significant dramatic releases. You know, um, I would have not put the generators in the basement uh, when, when you were sitting in an area that was susceptible to tidal waves. But, but uh, you know, there, there, were, there were decisions made there that in hindsight were probably not good decisions. But in general, the reactor itself uh, design behaved pretty well, actually. If, they, if the generators wouldn't have been washed away by the tidal wave, everything would have been fine after the earthquake. Um, 
So, so th th that, that, to me, we've learned from accidents. Uh, a lot of the advanced designs take into account a lot of those, a lot of those lessons learned. A lot of them have safety systems that are, that are much more, this gets back to communication, we call it passive safety, but what does that mean? Uh, it doesn't require human intervention. Physics, let physics work for you. Um, so, but, you know, in the United States, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to hear, talk to you more sometime about the way that f the reaction was in France. When Fukushima happened, I, I, I was watching CNN. And I'm watching the hydrogen, ex the explosions, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to shut down the entire fleet, you know. And the, the, the response in the United States was, was, was not what I expected. It was more, it was, uh, it was thoughtful. But, it, but it, it didn't go to the Germany, let's phase, let's shut everything down. Um, Japan had to respond the way they did. I think that was appropriate. But in general, the United States response was quite, quite different than what I thought it would be in the first couple days. Because it, it happened on a weekend, right? It happened on a Friday morning. I, mean, I was in DOE when it happened. And, and by that Tuesday, I was watching, and I'm like, just like everybody else, I'm like, oh my gosh, do they really have control over this? And we had some people who were communicating we knew a lot about them, so we lab people were being called by people who were on on site, and I don't. And, and there was some nervous times. So, so if you're a member of the public, who's not a nuclear person, that that's a pretty scary thing. I'm rambling, but that's kind of the accident part. He also asked about the future workforce. So the future uh, workforce. So 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 the future workforce. So, I. I've been struck by the number of young people who are interested in it, again, as a part of a sustainable, clean energy system go forward. It's not, a tr it's, it's not the only reason why people go into the field. But when you talk to a lot of these entrepreneurs and you ask them, either privately or even, even publicly, why are they doing this? It's because they feel like they're saving the planet. That's what they say. That's what Jake, Jake, Jake DeWitt down in Oklahoma and Sunnyville, if you had him here, he and Caroline, Cochrane, if they were here, they'd say they're saving the planet. So there's some of those, those kids are coming in. Um, to me, that's the change in the dialogue. That's why I hope I don't have the same diagram in 15 years from now. <laughs> if I may, just once. In France, sure. it's the opposite. I mean, the same people, young people, who are, uh, who are they say, green, green movements, etc., are against nuclear energy. Well, well, and a lot they of lump, the lot they, they lump them together. Yeah, but a lot of the kids, but the majority of the kids here who quote green movement are also against it. So I don't want to yeah. paint a picture where everybody okay. here in the yeah. green movement's for nuclear energy. Yeah. But there is a component of a lot of these advanced nuclear companies are coming from they're millennials, mm -hmm. uh, and, and 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 they're coming at it from a very different perspective, and they don't think mushroom cloud when they when they when they see think nuclear. They think different. So I'm sorry we're at the end of the hour, so we'll have to stop here. But Mark will be here for some moments afterwards if you want to talk to him, raise your questions. So let's thank Mark for stimulating the lecture.